Good morning, everyone. My name is Gina Rodriguez. I'm the project manager for the Community Health Training Institute. I would like to welcome you this morning to this online training, Using Data to Tell Your Story. It's going to be led by Dr. Sonori Ersprung. But before I let her introduce yourself, I would like to welcome you again to this online training and give you some more information about how it's going to work. There we go. Um, so this training, uh, as you'll see, will have a chance to give you guys some an opportunity to ask questions. Um, as some of you have already been doing already, there's a chat box and a question box on the right hand side of your screen. Um, you will be using that throughout the training because if you're having trouble hearing us or you feel like you're missing something, you can ask us question but also our presenter will also be asking you questions so you can type in your answers in the chat and question box on the right hand side of your screen um, immediately at the end of the webinar we'll have a survey that pops up to let us know how you think uh, we did and if you have any ideas for any upcoming online trainings that you would like uh, to share with us we would love to hear it um, and after this recording, or excuse me, after this training, you'll also receive an email that has all the slides attached to it for this presentation, along with the recording as well. So you could watch it and share it um, as well. We'll also be live tweeting throughout this training, so please feel free to join the conversation online on Twitter. Um, you can use our hashtag, MA Coalitions, um, and where our Twitter handle is at HRIA Institute. This is what your right hand screen should look like so that you can type in questions in the chat box. Um, and if you need any help troubleshooting anything, please feel free to let us know. And this is where you're typing answers to the questions from the presenter. Um, I want to thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're going to get started. And I also wanted to let you know that this online training is brought to you for free thanks to the generous funding by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And I am going to pass it along to our trainer. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. As you heard, my name is Sonori Ersprung. I am from the Department of Public Health at the Office of Statistics and Evaluation. So we deal a lot with health data, and a lot of you get your health data from us. So we wanted to better equip you to kind of navigate that and how best to use it. Um, as was mentioned, um, this is a follow-up to kind of a part one presentation about um, health data in general. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about how to use that health data that, that was um, described in the earlier training to tell a story. So today we're gonna go through how to tell a story, and I'm kind of like skipping to the end in a sense, but I'm gonna tell you exactly how. So we're gonna first think about how we develop a narrative, how we identify audience that we wanna target that narrative to, and how we identify Themes, um, to kind of complement the narrative. We're going to talk about how you would identify what data you would want to use to support that narrative, what data you currently have, and then how and when to collect data where, that you don't have. And then we'll go over at the end, and this could be a whole webinar in itself, how to kind of translate those narratives and that data for lay audiences. Um, so that part will be, will be a little bit more brief than we'd like, but um, hopefully it'll give you a flavor of how to do each of these things. All right, first we're gonna ask you guys a question. I know some of you answered this during registration, but in terms of who's in the virtual room, um, could you let us know what your comfort level is using data? And so there's gonna be a little poll that'll pop up, and we're asking um, that you rate it on a scale of one to five, five being regular analysis where you're familiar with statistical software and you do data analysis all the time, and one being um, where data is just terrifying and you would prefer not to use it when possible. All right, I'll give you guys a few moments to put in your answers. Go ahead and select it there on the screen. And it's totally fine. We know there's gonna be people on all ends of the spectrum. All right, 
looks like we got a lot of folks kind of in the middle and towards the upper end of feeling more comfortable, but we still got a lot of folks who are, you know, not super proficient and feeling very comfortable. So I'll do my best to translate, but if at any point in the presentation you feel like there's words you don't understand or um, something was unclear, we're going to pause for questions throughout, but you can also raise your hand or type into the chat box if you have immediate questions. All right, let's jump right in. So, how do we tell a story? Let's jump into the first part, how you develop a narrative. And I think it's really important to think right off the bat about what audiences you are trying to reach. Now, a lot of times you are trying to reach multiple audiences, but if there's a specific target that you have in mind, that's gonna change what data you choose, Kind of tailor the data you pick and the way you frame it to the specifics of that grant, right? So if you're applying for a maternal health grant to address racial disparities, you're not going to pick a data set to use that doesn't include race and ethnicity data, right? Or you're not going to include a data set that doesn't have specific information about your region that you're applying for the grant for. Similarly, if you're doing quality improvement or quality assessment, you're not going to pick a data set that's updated every 10 years because you need to know how did things change in the past quarter or the past PDSA cycle. So the same goes for lots of different types of audiences. When you're presenting to funders, you want to convince people of how much you've accomplished with the money that you've been given. Community health needs assessments would be a totally different set of criteria, health impact assessments. If you're using data to explain and justify spending money in one area versus another, you need comparison data in there. So we're going to go through some examples of how you would think about these different audiences and which data you would use um, to support um, a narrative targeted at that audience. All right, so once you've identified your audience, you want to identify some themes, right? You want to build the actual story, the narrative. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that I see time and time again is that people wait until the end of a grant or the end of a project to even think about this, right? They're so caught up in needs assessment and in launching all their activities that they don't think about what's the hook, what's the story that we're telling about what we do. And I'm going to um, reference some work that Daniel Pink um, did around what they call the Pixar pitch. Um, and he said in one of his uh, recent books, in order to move others, we need to become much better at clearly stating what it is we want and where it is we want to want people to go. And so that's really what building a narrative is about, right? Bringing people on a journey with us and helping them understand what motivates us and why we are excited about our project so that they too are excited and committed to that same um, work. And so the Pixar pitch is a framework that um, I learned of through a, a coalition I was working with, the Healthy Neighborhood Equity Fund over at the Conservation Law Fund. And that is a certain framework um, that we can apply to our work doing implementation of various programs. Um, but it's similar to what they used to build stories for, a, or convincing compelling stories for a Pixar film, for example. And the framework is, you're, you're telling people once upon a time, there was this, this population or this town or this clinic, that's you know, where you work, and every single day, this thing happened, this thing happened. So that would be the problem you're trying to solve. So every single day, we see obesity rates rising and we see kids who you know, are not getting access to healthy foods, fruits and vegetables or whatever it is you're addressing until one day, and that's where your project comes in, right? The thing that you're doing differently. Until one day we said, We're, we had enough of this. We're gonna look at how to more equitably provide fruits and vegetables to the people in our town to address this. And because of that, these policies were passed. And because of that, more people had access. And because of that, more and more stores started carrying healthy foods because there were incentives for them to do so. Until finally, and that's, that's kind of the long-term goal. That's kind of the hope that you want to tell people. Until finally, um, we started seeing more people being actually consuming fruits and vegetables, and they're getting healthier. And um, some of those, those disparities are disappearing. So that's that's a framework that we can use um, in narrative telling, but it lines up really well with um, a tool that I think a lot of us have to use regularly in our grant work, in our program work, in our clinic work, which is the logic model. 
So logic models are made up of lots of different parts. You've learned about them in previous trainings for sure. But it's briefly, it involves outlining for your particular grant or project what the inputs are, so what resources you're putting in, then what activities you're going to do with those resources, and then what the direct outputs of those activities are, right? So you, the activity is we are starting a recruitment program for patients in our clinic. The outputs are how many people actually signed up, right? The outcomes would be a little further out, but that would be the kind of behavior change. So once you've recruited folks to this, uh, say, a diabetes prevention program, DPP, um, the short-term outcomes would be the behavior change that comes once those 10 or 20 or 30 people sign up for your program. And then the impact would be the long-term um, impact, which would be things like chronic disease rates going down or lower obesity rates. So that's a really a much longer-term um, outcome that's related to the mission or the purpose of your work. So logic models um, line up very well with the Pixar pitch because what you're trying to do is, is highlight how you're going to roll out this change that you want to make, right? So the inputs describe what you're going to do the change with. The activities describe how you're going to do the change or enact the change. The outputs are kind of the then what happens in the short term. Outcomes are then what happens because of that. And then the impact is then what happens because of all of those other things, the kind of then finally piece, right? So that's kind of how it can line up. But I also want to caution you not to be tied to a linear narrative. I think we often focus the um, logic model on kind of a chronological order because we're telling our funders or our stakeholders how we're going to roll out our program. Now, a lot of times, though, at the end of a project, when we're summarizing what is important, we don't necessarily need to just only walk through it in order of when it occurred in time. People respond really well to themes, what makes our program special, better than just walking them through what we did in order. Oops. I think I pasted an extra one. So let's take the example of the uh, logic model, right? So um, in chronology, um, this is an example from a municipal wellness program that we have at the Department of Public Health in which we kind of provide funding to help towns um, and communities implement nutrition and physical activity related policies. So if we walked through this in order, we would say, okay, the Department of Public Health, their community partners, municipal governments, local staff are all working together to do these activities, which is enact policy level change around food and physical activity to provide better access to folks. And then the outputs of the, those direct activities of passing those policies means that there's going to be more healthy food retail sites, more people are going to have access to be able to buy healthy food, there's going to be more public spaces safe for physical activity, and there's going to be more folks with ac access to that. Then, because of that, hopefully, better access means, and better affordability means, they're going to eat more healthy foods and vegetables, and they're going to engage in more physical activity. So that eventually, the impact is, we're going to see rates of chronic disease go down, and, and risk of obesity and other sequelae go down. So that would be kind of the chronology way. But this leaves out a lot of other aspects of this program. If we just talked about it in that linear narrative, that's, that makes us pretty special. So what we did was we went back and we said, okay, this is our logic model of how we are rolling out our project for our funder. But the themes of what makes us special are also important. So we asked our participants, we said, okay, all you folks involved in this program, what else makes us special aside from the fact that we're trying to fight this like really major health problem through innovative policy work. And so the themes that they identified were the fact that, yes, we're focusing on nutrition and obesity, but one thing that's really cool about the way we're doing that is that we're focusing at the highest level possible, so population level change. We're not doing a one-on-one -on -one intervention where we're educating patient by patient about their nutrition, or we're not doing personal training one-on-one. -on -one. We're working on policies and systems so that large swaths of people um, can be reached so that we're helping to lower barriers for entire towns or communities. 
So highest reach, trying to reach like large numbers for a small amount of money was another thing that kind of set us apart from other programs. Another thing that was not in the logic model that was a theme that we thought made us pretty special was that we were had a huge focus on health equity, making sure that communities that were higher need and higher risk for obesity or diabetes were being targeted. So yes, we're passing policies. Yes, we're focusing on nutrition and physical activity, but we're doing it amongst folks who need it the most. And then finally, a theme that we um, identified by asking folks was that the way we were doing this um, was really focused on sustainability so that we were in, engaging partners across the town and community, across the spectrum to partner with us in that work so that this work could continue even after the grant funding period ended or if the Department of Public Health were to disappear off the face of the planet. So those are some themes that came up. So just remember these, we're gonna to return to this at the end of the presentation when we talk about translating information for lay audiences. I'll, I'll flesh this out a little bit more. All right, so as you can see, those, I was just saying, those were not reflected as much in the logic model. But I'm gonna pause here for a second um, and see, you know, folks had some questions about that material, just some of the tips we went over around crafting a narrative and thinking about audiences before we move on to the next part. So as you were talking, we did have one question that came in, and the question is, is there a way to understand how to read and understand data that is presented to you as a targeted audience? Oh, there absolutely is. Maybe we could have a whole other webinar on, on receiving the data. So right now, I think as we go through um, this presentation, we're gonna talk a little bit about the differences between different types of data sources and um, how to build arguments for certain themes and audiences with those. So I think conversely that hopefully will inform you as to as a recipient of data, what that data means, what it doesn't mean. I'm gonna go through a lot of slides about certainly what not to interpret from certain data sources as well. Um, so I think that is really important to think of. So maybe we can hold that and then if I haven't answered it through the next slides, we can certainly come back to that um, at the end. Any other questions? That's it for now, but if people have more questions, please feel free to type them in the question box and we'll grab them as the question time comes along. Awesome. All right, so now that we've thought a little bit about how to craft our narrative, our story, if you will, um, and also who those stories are focused on, let's talk a little bit about identifying what data is needed to support those narratives. Now, because this is part two, in part one of this series, um, we went over some categories of types of health data that you might get from the Department of Public Health or other partners. And so these were the categories, health surveys, disease and injury registries, clinical data, and kind of count or census data. And for each of these data types in that presentation, we went over in great detail some of the considerations that you would think about when picking between different data sources. So we talked about thinking about what geography it covers. You know, if you're in a small town versus statewide, um, you, you have different amounts of data sources that would be relevant. We talked about thinking about the sample population. So if you're really interested in racial and ethnic minorities, then you want to make sure you pick a data set that includes those folks, right? If you're really interested in people who speak different languages, you want to make sure you have a data set that includes those folks or people with certain with, with hearing impairments or things like that. So who's in the population of the data set is really important to think about. And then frequency. So if you are, again, doing quality improvement where you need to update your results every quarter, a data source that's updated every other year is not going to be appropriate for you. But if you're writing a grant, that might be just fine because it covers the geography you need and the people you need. So those were the three qualities of um, data that we, we highlighted in the last presentation. And keep in mind, now we're going to talk a little bit about how you apply those qualities of data to pick certain data sources for certain audiences. So let's go over health surveys. So health surveys, some examples would be things like the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, or BRFSS, or the Youth Health Survey, so that's done in schools. We talked uh, a great deal about this in part one. So when would we use these kinds of data sets? For what audiences, for what narratives? So you'd wanna use health surveys when you want to know about 
all citizens in your particular region, um, not just those in the healthcare system, right? So if you want to know about even, you know, my dad or my husband who never go to the doctor, as well as my brother who might go all the time, then hospitalization data set would not be appropriate for you because you'd be missing those folks who are never in care, right? So you want to think health surveys, on the other hand, use a complicated um, waiting system to sample folks, and they randomly try and call as many folks as possible so that they're including people who are both, you know, using the ER and people who aren't. You'd also use health surveys if you're trying to build a narrative around behaviors, right? So when you go into the ER with, you know, an injury or um, some sort of diabetes complication, you're, they're not asking you necessarily and putting in your medical record, how often do you eat fruits and vegetables? How many minutes of physical activity do you get? Even if the doctor asks that, that doesn't always get in the data set. So if you're interested about behaviors, health behaviors, binge drinking, vaccinations, things like that, then health surveys are going to give you way more information than things that are tied to billing or hospitalization codes. When you want to know about a specific subpopulation, so as we discussed in part one, health surveys are mathematically designed to be representative of the state of Massachusetts. Well, actually of the nation, really, too, in the case of the BRFSS. So they make sure that they get so many folks who are Asian women or African American men or all these other subgroups so that they can report in Massachusetts, here how, here's how we're doing on health in these subgroups. So if you are interested in that, if you're interested for an entire state to know something about older Asian women or um, persons with disability who are also under the age of such and such, that would be a really um, useful data source for you. Also, um, if you need this data relatively frequently, health surveys are usually administered every one to two years. So you can um, get that information and how it's changing over time. And because the questions are relatively consistent, you can use health surveys when you're interested in, in comparing trends over time. Because when you call someone and you say, hi, um, has your doctor told you that you have been diagnosed with diabetes? You know, 10 years ago versus today, you can compare that. Whereas certain other data sets, and we'll talk about this when we get to those, for example, uh, clinical data sets in the electronic medical record are influenced by major changes. So think changes in billing, changes in clinical practice. You know, if there's new diagnostic standards that say, oh, you shouldn't do prostate exams, in the EMR, you're going to suddenly see a huge drop in prostate exams. You don't know when you're trending that over time, whether it's because there's actually a drop um, in that particular uh, condition or if it's a drop in screening. So health surveys are useful when you're trending behaviors and awareness and things like that over time. All right. So when would you not want to pick health surveys as your data source for a certain narrative or product? So there's certain populations that are not included in some health surveys. So you'd want to educate yourself about that depending on the survey you're thinking about including. So in the case of the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, for example, it's only um, offered in a few languages. So I think, so certainly English, I think Portuguese and Spanish are the other ones. So if you're very interested about speakers of Vietnamese and Mandarin and other languages, this would not be a useful data set for you. It also doesn't include um, incarcerated or institutionalized persons. So you have to be very aware of who, again, is included in that sample. If you remember, that was one of the three criteria we, we discussed in uh, part one of this data set. Oops, wrong way. Um, health surveys are not useful when you want to know about cost or healthcare usage. So if your target audience is people who are interested in um, decreases in cost, health surveys are really not going to tell you a whole lot about that because billing information is not included. If, if you want to know about very specific small geographies, so in the state of Massachusetts right now, um, our our BRFSS survey, I think we have about 6,000 to 8,000 surveys for the entire state. So that's to cover 6 million people, right? So the odds of there being enough people who picked up their phone out, out of that 6,000 who live in your tiny neighborhood, if the odds of there being like enough folks where we can say something meaningful about that mathematically is pretty low. So a lot of times the BRFSS and other health surveys data is not available in smaller geographies. It's really designed to be representative at a state level, and it's pretty effective at a county level as well. 
Now, that's just a smattering. That's just an example of how we would apply those three data qualities we discussed in part one of this series to some, some critical decisions about which data sets around health surveys we would use when we're crafting narratives for certain audiences. It's certainly not comprehensive of every possible decision you could make. So these are just, these are just some examples. All right, disease and injury registries. So as we described in part one, these are data sets that include every single person that fit a certain either disease category or event type. So the mass cancer registry includes everyone who's reported that they've been diagnosed with cancer. Uh, the weapons related injury surveillance system includes every reported weapons related injury in Massachusetts. So that, that gives you um, a data set that you can use when you wanna speak to every event or case that's reported. It's not a sample like the health surveys where it's only 6,000 out of 6 million people are included. So this is literally all the cancer cases you can take a look at. So if you're, you know, trying to write a grant about a very specific subpopulation, you can literally make the argument that in Massachusetts, the need is definitely this, because this is literally all the people who, who have cancer that we're talking about um, in the registry data. It's also very useful if you want to know about diagnostic or event specific information. So, you know, they include things like labs, they include things like stage of cancer that's been diagnosed. And again, I'm using the cancer registry as just one example. There are other disease registries out there. Um, and it's also, you know, if you're interested in just weapons related injuries, then the risk uh, system is perfect for you. If you want to know about specific geographies, so this literally covers the whole state. So you could look up for your particular town how many people were diagnosed with cancer. Um, if you want to identify disparities in subpopulations, again, literally everyone's in this data set who has that condition. So you can dig down and say, what are the disparities for um, Asian women or African American women versus men um, and other subpopulations? And because these, these registries have been in place for a long time, you can use it to trend information over time. When would you not use a disease reg uh, registry? Well, if you're interested in um, outcomes or behaviors. So it, you can certainly look up if someone was diagnosed with cancer, what stage it was, what their race and ethnicity is, what their age is, but you don't know what happened to them afterwards, right? It's not like an electronic medical record where you can follow that one person over time and see, okay, what about at their second visit or their third visit, how are, how are things going? Um, it also doesn't tell you about behaviors. You don't know what risk, behavior, you don't know how much they engaged in physical activity before they were diagnosed. So in something like, in a case like that, a health survey would be more useful. Um, again, if you wanna know changes about the one patient over time, we just talked about that. If you wanna know about treatment or cost, this doesn't tell you how many procedures they had, how many ER visits they had, how much prescriptions they had filled. So um, for cost analyses, that would not be appropriate. Okay, clinical data. Now this is the biggest bucket, and this is what you guys ask us for the most, and we try to provide it. There's a lot of different kinds, but three of the biggest kinds of clinical data that we described in part one were claims data, so that's literally when an insurance company pays a bill related to what you've done, uh, had done at the doctor's office, or in the hospital. If you have surgery, if you are in the ER, anything related to billing is included in claims bill data. Uh, administrative or discharge data, so that includes both for in-hospital um, admissions as well as ER visits. That's when you go to the hospital and you, you know, they're like, okay, Sonori just checked in. She had all these things done. There's a record that's generated there. Um, and then electronic health records, which includes to some degree um, both inpatient and outpatient, but we really focus on um, that as a data source from outpatient clinics. So if you go to your annual well visit and your doctor says, oh, or you have diabetes, that's, that would be in the electronic medical record. If you have to go to the ER because of something to do with the, your diabetes, then that would be in the hospitalization, the administrative discharge data or the ER data. So those are the three categories. And they're really, really useful when you wanna calculate burden or utilization. So if you're writing a product, a report, a grant, whatever, showing why you need more healthcare services, we need to hire X many more nurses. 
we need to open X many more programs um, to, to help intervene in this condition. This is really useful because you can say, well, it's because we have 100,000 people coming in every year into the ER with this condition. Or we spend, um, you know, so many millions of dollars on this condition. So again, another scenario would be when you want to estimate cost or return, return on investment. That's what ROI stands for. Return on investment is something a lot of people ask us for. So claims data or billing data is one of the only ways you can get to that hard number without doing some estimation and guesswork around literally what is it costing our clinic or our region. Uh, clinical data is also great when you want more information about the health outcome. So if you want to analyze lab values or look at how multiple diagnoses interact. Unfortunately, in the cancer registry, if you want to know how many people with cancer also have diabetes, you're out of luck because they only have information about cancer. Whereas in clinical data, it has all the diagnosis codes that someone might have had in their time at the hospital or with their doctor's office. So you can start looking at multiple diseases and multiple uh, lab values. It's also useful when you want to trend clinical care over time. So if you are in a clinic or a hospital system and you make a change, right? You do a training on how to better measure blood pressure values for your patients. You can literally trend it and see before and after you did that intervention, how much did blood pressure value um, completion rates go up in the electronic medical record. And it's also great for geographic patterns. So billing data, to bill someone, you need their address to mail them that delightful bill that we all love receiving. So as a result, there's a good amount of geographic data in these records. So you can do a lot of mapping, et cetera. So when would you not use clinical data? So clinical data is not so useful when you want to estimate trends that are not impacted by clinical practice change. I described this earlier when we're talking about health surveys. If, you know, the American Medical Association decides we're not going to do that test anymore, or if they completely change the billing codes, you're going to see changes in the data set that have nothing to do with how many people have the disease, but it's based on how we collected the data. So for those of you in clinical practice, you know that diagnosis codes are called ICD codes, and you would have been familiar with the fact that recently there was a major switch from ICD-9, and stands for International Classification of Disease, uh, they switched from 9 to 10. There's like infinitely more codes out there, so we're seeing totally higher numbers of how many codes are being entered in these data systems that has nothing to do with the patient's sickness level. It has to do with how we're capturing information. Now, clinical data is also not great if you want to estimate prevalence or incidence. So for those of you who are not epi people, those are the words we use to say how many people in the whole population have a disease or how many people got the disease recently. Now, because we're only getting people who are coming into the doctor's office, we don't know how many people that never enter the hospital system might have the disease. So we can't do that kind of population estimate to say in Massachusetts, we're pretty sure this is how many people have diabetes or obesity. Instead, we can say of all the people who came into the doctor's office or of all the people who were hospitalized, here's how many people got that diagnosis code. So clinical data is also not as useful when you want to stratify by certain demographics. So when you're billing someone, there's really no reason a lot of times for them to collect race and ethnicity or income or education level. So if you want to go back to that data set to use it to do disparities analyses, those fields are either non-existent or really poorly populated and hard to use. So if that's something of interest for you, it might be better to um, utilize health survey data or something with slightly uh, cleaner information. Now, that's a little different for electronic health records. Some health systems do uh, a really good job of making sure that they populate race and ethnicity, but it certainly doesn't always give you information on disability status, education level, and other demographic info. So you have to see what's in that data set when you um, are, are looking to utilize it. We do have a question specific to the electronic health records. Sure. While you're talking about it. It says, how do we use... Oops. Sorry, went away for a second. I'm going to bring it back up. How do we use EHR data without violating HIPAA? There's a lot of controversy around de-identification. Is there a best practice, method, or strategy that is recommended? 
Yeah, so if you're talking about using your own, if you, if you are at a clinic and you're talking about how to use your own um, EMR data, then that's something your privacy and confidentiality data office should be able to help you with and your IRB, your Institutional Review Board. But if you're talking about data that you get from the state or from one of your partners, so for example, if you're a clinic that's part of the Mass League of Community Health Centers, there are entire services dedicated to helping you analyze data in a de-identified way. So for example, the drive system, if you work at a, a Mass League site, a community health center, literally scrubs all people's names and stuff like that so that you can look at trends in the population without being able to find a specific person's personal information. Similarly, the data that we provide from the state has been scrubbed of all identifiers. So when we put out tables, there's no way of looking up someone's social security number or name or anything like that so um, there's definitely best practices out there if you want to develop if you want to use a data set you personally have and to make sure you're um, abiding by HIPAA institutions all should have resources available to um, ensure the safety of patients and the IRB and the data office are two great starts right anything else um, I think we can save the other questions for the questions. Okay, great. And we will have a question time. So, but excellent question about the EHR stuff. Um, and I will say also at the state, we have literally a team of lawyers who look at this all day, every day to make sure that um, we're doing the best we can to protect any kind of privacy and data confidentiality. But we don't even get the identifiers from a lot of these data sets. So we couldn't even track someone down and violate HIPAA if we wanted to for some of them. So, but we're still really careful and we think about that all the time. All right, so when else would clinical data not be appropriate? When you want to estimate behaviors or prevention, right? So sometimes that's included, that your doctor does ask whether you smoke, for example. But sometimes things like how many vegetables you eat, how many, again, how many minutes of exercise you have, um, how often you engage in other risk behaviors, certain substance abuse, things like that, that's not included in, in billing data, right? Or if you're in the ER, no one's going to ask you about all that stuff. So things like health surveys that make sure to include questions outside of just what's making you sick in the moment um, would be a much better data source to use if you're trying to craft a narrative or, or write a report around those health behaviors. I could go on, I literally could have done a 90 minute presentation just on the, all the ways you can use clinical data, but those are just some examples of how you can use those data qualities to make strategic decisions of which data source to pick for certain products. All right, count or census data. Again, we went over this in part one, but as a recap, this is a type of data that includes every single person in the population. So now a registry is something that includes everyone with a certain condition, right, like cancer or an injury. Now, census data is literally all the people. So um, US census data, every 10 years, they count all the folks in the country and they provide a lot of de detailed demographic information on them. Similarly, birth records. If you were born in Massachusetts, you should have a birth certificate. That's literally everyone. And similarly, if you die in Massachusetts, you have a death record that exists. So um, that's really useful when you want to know about every single person in the population, right? So if you want to know about birth weights, um, how many folks of a certain category um, had, you know, were born underweight, or how many people in the death record died of a certain condition, you're literally getting every single death in Massachusetts, every confirmed documented death. Um, it's also very useful when you want to be able to stratify by multiple demographic characteristics. So um, with census data, for example, you can um, take a look at not just how many, uh, I always use Asian women because I'm an Asian woman, so that's like my default category. <laughs> but if you wanted to know how many women were also Asian and also engaged, um, were faced with a disability, then you could really, narrow that down. You could also then further narrow that down how many Asian women with a disability were also um, in a certain educational strata or um, walk to work or something like that. Like all those items that are in the census, you can break people down into really small uh, categories to really dig deep into how many folks in the, in the Commonwealth um, 
fit those criteria or how many folks in your neighborhood or uh, zip code fit those criteria. So in part one, we go over some um, data resources as to where you can get this information, but the U.S. Census Bureau has a really great um, interface called Fact Finder that allows you to look that up. The count and census data is also great, again, because it includes everyone, when you want to know about smaller geographies. So uh, if you're focused, if you're writing a report about one neighborhood, then you need a data source that tells you something about just that neighborhood versus um, if you're okay with just having state level data, then there's a lot more data sources open to you. Count and census data is really useful also when you want to overlay social determinants. So a lot of times um, data sets won't have everything in one data set, but say you want to use clinical data or you want to use health survey data to, to map out how a certain condition is um, distributed across the Commonwealth. You can then use census data to overlay on that map um, to look at which neighborhoods also fit certain social determinants. So that could include things like social cohesion or engagement. It could include things like education or, or income level, poverty level, um, immigration status. And so you can map those two things together to inform you know, your narrative around saying, okay, folks who, neighborhoods that have high numbers of um, foreign born residents also are seeing higher rates of this certain health condition or uh, lower rates of vaccinations. Maybe we should make sure we have better, more linguistically appropriate, culturally appropriate materials and, and increase access for those folks. So you can kind of overlay this data um, to, con to build a story or build a narrative. When would you not want to use count or census data? Well, if you want to know clinical outcomes or lab values, aside from the death record, you're not going to get that information in, in census or birth records. If you want to be able to estimate cost, you're not going to be able to get that in, uh, in count or census. If you want more frequent administration, so in the case of the census, it's only done every 10 years, and then there's kind of a mini version called the American Community Survey that's done on a more rolling basis. But because it's done so infrequently, if you're trying to say, well, in my one year of my program, we saw, you know, this education go up by blah, blah, blah percent, census isn't going to be updated frequently enough for you to be able to say that. Oops. So those are just some of the examples of ways that we can use those data qualities to make some critical decisions about which of these data sources to use. So I will pause there. I know that was a lot of information. So I will pause there to see if there's any questions. There are. So there were a number of questions that came in. There was also a request from someone to see if you can slow down a little bit. I know that's hard because there's so much that you want to cover and share with the audience. I did want to remind people that we are going to be sending out the slides to this presentation along with the recording of this presentation and also last year's recording as well, which is an accompaniment to the training that Sonori is doing right now. So the first questions that came in as you were talking were how slash when do you think the new gender classifications, specifically LGBTQ, will be incorporated into health survey data and how will it affect longitudinal, longitudinal data? Um, I was wondering in the demographic sections, getting beyond the male, female, or subpopulation analysis. So that's one question. Yeah, no, that's a great one. Um, I am personally not familiar with the exact date for any of these. I know in Massachusetts, we just this past year, um, released our new um, SOGI guidelines, which is sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, so it'll take a little while for all the data collection instruments to be updated, um, so on and so forth. And this is a huge problem because a lot of data sets do not adequately cover this information. Certainly clinical data um, has a long way to go. And because institutional change has to occur clinic by clinic, health system by health system, EMR by EMR, you know, we're, we're working with that, but I don't have an exact date. Could I take a look at the question again? Sure. Uh, there was a second part. Oh, for, for the actual analyses. Yes, I'm sorry, I do not have an exact date. I can look up with the BRFSS. I think that's one where they were interested in um, doing that more recently, more, more soon, more quickly. And then there is um, information on sexual identity to some degree in some of the school surveys. 
Um, so we are able to look, um, but I believe that's only LGB. I don't know if they have T or Q um, in those surveys. So it's, it's a huge area and it's one that we need advocates to, to be loud voices asking for to make sure that we can make sure everyone has the same access to care. And then the next question is, is the alternative captured in the data sets? Not everyone manages their health using the medical model slash Western methods. Is the data available? And if so, where would that be located? For, so for covered care, so if um, your insurer covers things like acupuncture or other um, non-traditional services that would be included in the billing data or the claims data. Um, if you are part of a health system that has um, that offers those kinds of things, the type of diagnostic codes and procedure codes I just mentioned, ICD-10, the kind of the newer updated version, has a lot more options for what procedures you could get, and so they can get really detailed. So that really depends on the billing practices and diagnostic coding of your health system. So clinical data would probably be your best bet for those data um, and those types of procedures. And then the next question is, what about MD MDPH uh, syndromic surveillance data? So that would fit under the disease uh, registries category. So syndromic surveillance is, again, like the cancer registry or the injuries, um, it would be data that you have to report, right? So if, if someone has Zika or Ebola, it automatically gets tagged and reported to um, the Department of Public Health. At this point, a lot of sites have it automated so that the minute the diagnostic code goes into the EMR, it automatically gets sent to us. So that would fall under the same um, pros and cons for that data set. And then one last question is for death records, um, is, is it true that reason for death is included? I heard that there were limitations because of the real cause of death, such as suicide and drug overdose, is often not the listed, listed cause. What are your thoughts? Oh my gosh, these are such good questions. <laughs> you, I, last time it was an incredibly smart and engaged audience as well. So you are absolutely on point. So uh, I can't remember how they phrase it, but cause of death is just what gets assigned at the time of the death certificate being issued. It does not, in, they do not investigate every single case. So um, in the case of things like overdoses, there's actually a whole queue of cases to be reviewed by the office of the chief examiner to determine whether they're um, uh, overdoses or not. So some of those are verified, but for sure, there's death certificates out there where someone just says, oh, the person had a cardiac arrest or, oh, they suffocated or something like that, and they might not be included. Now, the Department of Public Health has been doing some really intense um, work to kind of do some mathematical modeling and some quality assurance, looking at all the death data to try and mathematically predict how many of those cases might be missing. So if you take a look at our Chapter 55 site, you can see some really sophisticated work that's really groundbreaking nationally on estimating the true number of overdoses. We have a fabulous, brilliant team working to try and look deeper to see if there are other words in the, in the um, ambulance record or in, in notes somewhere where someone's like, oh, there was a syringe found, or oh, we found. So, so there are ways we're trying to um, do some data quality, but you're right, if you just look at the death data, um, raw, you, you may miss some of that. And then with regard to things like suicide, um, we absolutely believe that it's an undercount of how many real suicides are out there because it might be seen as um, an accident or an injury or again, a cardiac arrest. Um, and unless there's something specified about there being a note or a communication or the police being involved, it may not get entered into the death record. So you're absolutely right. Take it with a pinch of salt and always frame these kinds of things as as these are confirmed cases only, or um, we're pretty sure it's an undercount because of all those limitations. Good work. Thank you. No problem. Thank you guys for being so engaged. All right. So now we went through, that was like the jargoniest, most dense part of the presentation. So we talked about some of those qualities about all the different data sets and when we might want to use some versus others. So let's go through some examples of how we would identify the data that you currently have. All right, so most of those data sets I described were um, specific to the data that we at the department provide to you guys, um, because 
this was supposed to be helping train you to then use it effectively. So let's take some example audiences and narratives and try and figure out how we decide which of those data sets we apply to those audiences or narratives. So take a, for instance, say you're trying to estimate or convince an audience of need, right? You're, you're saying perhaps you're applying for a grant and you're trying to illustrate high need in your town because you want to implement a 10-year plan to lower the burden of chronic disease, right? So you're trying to convince this funder that there's a high burden of chronic disease in your town. What are some data sources that you might be interested in using? All right, and like you guys can actually type stuff into the chat box. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a quick reveal, but you're certainly welcome to share um, any of your thoughts or suggestions as we go through these examples. All right, so of the data sets that we just described and talked about a little bit, um, which are the ones that would have a representation for your community? Remember we talked about the geography part of this? So if, you're, if your community, if you're, I think the question was uh, burden of chronic disease in your town. Okay, so it's possible that while a health survey would be useful to estimate disease for the, for the community, for the state, there probably isn't going to be a lot of data for your specific town unless you're in a really po highly populated town like Boston or Worcester or Springfield. So I think a, a good place to go here would be either clinical data or disease or injury registries because you know that you have enough people that you can really drill down to your particular town and you can say this is how much, from the claims data, you can say this is how much it's costing citizens of our town, right, this, these chronic diseases. You can say, this is how many people are showing up in the ER and being hospitalized because of this. This is how many prescriptions are being written. And you can really drill down to that um, small level. Okay, another example. Uh, what about, say, you're trying to convince an audience that there's a huge burden on your clinic or healthcare system um, because of high utilization. People coming in to the doctor all the time. So what data sources might you use if you wanted to make the argument that you really think for your county, we need two new asthma home visiting programs because there's so many folks with, with asthma and we think that we really just, we need more resources um, to serve them. All right, let's think through all these different uh, data sources. So, and again, feel free to type in some suggestions or thoughts if you have questions about these scenarios I'll give you a minute to kind of think all right so if we're trying to make the argument for um, a county we know from a geographic perspective that we should have pretty good coverage in all our health data sets because it's a pretty big area um, and what we're when we're saying there's a high burden we're not just ask, we're, we're not interested in convincing the funder of how many people have asthma, right? Because you could have a million people with asthma, but as long as they're taking their meds, not having to go to the hospital, they have it under control, why would we open two new clinics and hire a bunch of community health workers and, and nurses and doctors? So um, health surveys would tell us about how many people had asthma, but it wouldn't tell us about this concept of utilization, how many people are in the hospital, getting prescriptions, going to the doctor. So that's where clinical data could really help us out, right? That's where we could say, guys, we need to open a new clinic because we have so, like, um, so many thousands of ER visits. If we just invested a fraction of how much that costs us using claims data, um, if we just invested a fraction of that in prevention, in helping those folks not have to go to the emergency room to begin with, we could be saving so much money and we could be having way less burden on our, on our healthcare system. So that's a way that you could tailor your narrative to focus on utilization and healthcare use. It doesn't really matter if it's one person coming in 100 times to the clinic, to the ER, or 100 people coming in once, I mean, the point is you have a ton of money being spent and a ton of resources being spent on all these emergency room visits. We had someone share that the pediatric asthma emergency room visits would be Ah, like ding, 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 we got a winner. <laughs> Laura, you are correct. So you hit the nail right on the head. Perfect. All right, 
take another example. Say you're trying to craft a narrative to really convince your audience about the inequities facing your community, right? So let's go back to, as oh no, not asthma, lies. Did I skip one? Is that a lie? No, anyway. All right, inequity. So say you're trying to convince folks um, of that there's this unjust, unfair difference um, by race for certain groups being impacted by breast cancer. How would you explore that? How would you figure out Okay, who in my community, based on race, is is potentially being differently impacted by breast cancer, or is everyone doing pretty much the same, and everyone's at equal risk, and they're you know they're all doing well? All right, think about that for a minute. Again, we've got all our our health survey options. We've got our disease and injury registry, clinical, and count. For those of you wondering what's been going on with this other petal, this is again borrowed from part one of <laughs> this series, and that had a kind of a, an assortment of miscellaneous data sources that we're just not touching for the sake of um, just helping you understand the biggest ones. Okay, so if you're interested in inequities, a real big factor is going to be do they collect race and ethnicity data in the data set? So billing data is not going to be your friend there. Usually that's pretty poorly populated, um, and it's it's or it's not in there at all. So um, health survey data could be good, but it again probably isn't going to be available for really small geographies because like, remember it's really hard to report. Um, it's hard to have enough people in small geographic areas to really say something with any kind of confidence or trust. So disease and injury registries would be an obvious choice because it includes every single person and it includes some basic information about them. Clinical data also could be. Sorry, just wanted to identify Nikki who did say that she would use disease and industry registries. Oh, and industry registries good so that work. She could look at the specific disease. Excellent. Oh my gosh, you guys are so ahead of the curve. Sorry, there's a little bit of a lag. I, I should give you guys a little more time. I apologize, <laughs> but good work. So yeah, exactly. So you've got a lot of detail. You also have information on what stage they've been diagnosed at. So you could also, you could not just look at did they or did they not get diagnosed with breast cancer, which is what you could tell from the clinical data. Instead, you could also say, you know, are some folks getting diagnosed at, high, at later stages? Are some folks' lab values different? And in the clinical data, you could say, okay, are some folks getting treated at different levels? Another data source that might be useful could be the death data. You could say, not only can you look at how, when are they getting diagnosed and if they're getting diagnosed, you could, could look at inequities by saying, how much are they using healthcare services, right? You could look at the clinical data to say, how often are they in the hospital? How often are they given certain drugs? And then you can use the death data to say, are folks dying more of these conditions? You know, are some races and ethnicities dying more of certain cancers than others? So these are all different ways, depending on the, the audience and the narrative, that you could frame the same health condition to really highlight the argument and the, and the um, case that you're particularly making. So good work, folks. All right. So let's talk a little bit about um, how you would think through some of these scenarios even outside of the data that you can get from the Department of Public Health or some of these secondary data sources, right? So a secondary data source is a data source that someone somewhere else collected for some other reason, but we can use it for what we want um, because it just happens to be there and they're willing to share it. Conversely, primary data um, is data that you guys have to collect, right? Your clinic has to collect. No one else is going to do it for you. So that includes two different categories of data, quantitative and qualitative. This was covered in part one, but quantitative would include things like surveys, uh, program records, um, program tracking sheets, administrative records at your clinic or your grant. Um, so there's, it's numbers, it's things you can put on a graph, very specific like that. Qualitative data, is a little bit more nebulous, a little bit more nuanced. It includes kind of free text, stories, um, nuances, 
And it's collected through a number of different ways. You might hear the phrase focus group, or it's through different kinds of interviews. Sometimes you hear key informant interview. Sometimes you hear people call it a cognitive interview or an in-depth interview. The point is you're asking people open-ended questions and getting their perspectives. So this is useful for a number of different um, parts of your program. So when you're rolling out a program, you know, there's kind of three broad phases. Um, you plan what you're going to do. So during that time, you want to identify kind of whether there's need for your program or grant, whether you have capacity to do it, is, is, is it even feasible for that particular population and time and scale. So this phase is called needs assessment, and qualitative data can be really valuable because there's only so much at seeing how many people have asthma in your community can tell you, right? Um, it, it doesn't tell you kind of how, how many doctors and nurses um, you might need, so you might need to talk to folks and say, oh, do we need medical translators? Do we need patient navigators? What are the barriers facing our patients to actually address this problem? So it can really highlight um, the best practices of, of fixing that problem for your particular community. Feasibility, there's really no way a secondary data source can tell you how feasible it is for your commute, for your clinic. You'll have to look at, you know, ask people about cost and capacity and training. So in order to do that, you literally need to talk to people, right? So next, you kick off your program, you launch it, you, you figure out all the, the key needs and feasibility levels, and now you're in implementation. So um, on a quantitative side, you're going to be collecting what we call process measures. So you're going to be like, how many people registered for the program? Or um, how many referrals have we made? Those are just like numbers that you track as you're rolling out a program to make sure you're actually getting participants and things like that. But qualitatively, you also want to capture some data at that time as you're implementing it. You don't want to wait till the end of your whole five-year grant to say, oh, why did no one show up when we made a referral? You want to be asking folks about barriers, facilitators, right then and there as you're implementing. And if they're saying, oh, it's because you, you don't have linguistically appropriate materials, or uh, no one took the time to explain why that should show up, then if you don't ask people those questions, you're not going to know the info to make those adjustments as you're doing implementation. Um, as after you've started implementing your program, then you go move into the assessment phase. So these all line up with the logic model we went over earlier, right? The planning, the process measures of when you're implementing, and then the outcome measures are kind of like the short-term then what, and then the impact measures are the long-term kind of, and then finally these things will happen. So outcome measures and impact measures, uh, a lot of times we do use secondary data for. We call those performance measures a lot of times in grants. And those of you who work in grant-funded environments are very familiar with those, I'm sure. But it's also important to collect qualitative data, right? So one example is when we're addressing really big health problems like obesity or chronic disease, and we're rolling out a program to improve nutrition, that's just one piece of the puzzle, right? There's a lot of reasons that people are at higher risk for chronic disease, and we're just doing one um, intervention to make it a little bit easier for them to be at lower risk, but we're not fixing their whole town, their community, their society. So we want to be asking people about barriers and facilitators and context to be able to interpret these outcome measures. And we also want to know a little bit more about, you know, if people's nutrition isn't going up as, as much as we thought. If people aren't actually consuming fruits and vegetables, maybe we improved access, but we didn't improve affordability. So even in that medium and short-term outcome, we want to figure out what's driving people's behaviors, what is happening on the ground as we're implementing that is important to contextualize for the different audiences as we're reporting. And it's important so that we can adjust um, mid-course as we are um, rolling out programs. All right. So just a couple of the way the um, wanted to help you think about collecting your own data to fill in some gaps where the um, secondary data that we went through may not fill you know, all the needs, um, things that are really specific to your populations, your programs, um, information only you have. Um, so we do have a number of questions, um, and I think we'll go through as many as we can. Mm -hmm. I, we're sort of definitely watching the time because we mm -hmm. want to get people 
um, we want to wrap up uh, mm -hmm. at the time we said we were going to wrap up. So, yeah. Sonari, we'll take them one by one. And if you feel like you want to save some for the end, then sure. we'll, we'll do that. So the first question is, how do the questions for data collection get framed? Who determines the questions for data collection that is captured by DPH? Uh, like the categories for demographics, you know, did people have to advocate for trans and queer? Um, who do people advocate? Oh, that's a great question. So um, a lot of the data sources um, that we have at DPH, we don't necessarily get to control. So for example, the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, that is largely um, dictated by the CDC. So that's at a, a, a federal level. In fact, recently the Census Bureau uh, had an open public comment period talking and asking the public for feedback on whether they should add some race and ethnicity categories. Um, specifically, I think it was uh, Eastern and there was, I think, another one as well. Um, and so a lot of times people will actually literally ask the public for feedback on that. Other people that you would need to advocate for also would be for the clinical data sets, it would need to be for health systems to change and increase the specificity. A lot of times, you know, people, a, a hospital doesn't want to put money into redesigning the way their billing data or their electronic medical record is structured. It's expensive um, if they can't see the direct utility. And a lot of health systems are really committed to this. I'm not I'm just using that as an example. But when we get data from another place, you know, we need to convince them that it's worth the effort to redesign their um, their data collection instruments as well. I think at the department, the um, the Department of Public Health has a, a number of different means on the website of communicating information to us, having suggestions. I know the governor and the secretary are really committed to um, public engagement, so they would welcome your feedback on um, what additional data and what groups they would really like us to drill down in. And our commissioner is incredibly committed to um, social determinants and disparities. So she's already been working on better collection of homelessness data um, and other risk factors for substance abuse, so mental health. So we are already advocating for more information like that. Um, the next question is, if you are a low population rural area, the data doesn't show people in these areas of the state, and due to the inability to de-identify the data, how can this be addressed? It's an ongoing issue, and is it being addressed as an issue? It absolutely is. So um, we are already in talks with health systems out in the western part of the state who are very committed to this to see if they can provide additional clinical data to make sure that we can get some of that um, outpatient data on the western part of the state. And in terms of emergency room visits, um, hospitalizations, death records, birth records, all that does cover the entire state. So that data should be available um, at the very least, even in very sparsely populated areas. And then the next question is, are the registries and the birth slash death data electronic or paper? Oh, goodness, that's a good question. I don't work in vitals, so I don't know what they deal with. But there are certainly a lot of electronic uh, records, but I think there are still um, a good amount of paper records. I don't know exactly where in the chain, but uh, I know we've come a long way in digitizing a lot of these processes, but there's still a few holdouts. Um, and then the next question is, isn't the lack of data collection an inequity issue? Um, is there demographic information on the addiction issue? issue and where would you find data to see if the opioid crisis is impacting a particular population more than others? If not, why not? Absolutely. This is an, an equity issue and it's a justice issue. So that goes back to the first question about advocating for this. I think, you know, all of us in this field need to convince folks why it's in the general population's best interest even if it may not make sense just for the reason they collected the original data, say billing, um, that we include these fields. Um, but in terms of the opioid question specifically, I would again encourage you to take a look at both our um, Chapter 55 website, which is where they have a lot of really interesting data visualizations. I mean, it's it, they put it together so quickly to make sure that we could get it to the public, and they're doing even more amazing work um, around looking at these disparities. And so there's information there on differences by incarceration and other categories as well. Um, but there's also, there is demographic information in the injury um, surveillance systems I was describing, uh, the death records. Um, so 
some of the data sources do have that, and so we are looking at those disparities already. And then we're thinking um, creatively how to mathematically do it for the data sources where we don't have that info, where it's like uh, ambulance data, for example. If someone's like passed out in the ambulance, you can't ask them how they self-identify as a certain ethnicity, right? We just can't collect that info. Similarly, if someone's dead, we can't ask them whether or not how they identify whether they identify as Hispanic or not Hispanic. So there's some limitations to the nature of these data sets as well. And then one last, last question is, does the data get evaluated? And how do we know that the data or data collection is good or very or viable rather than base, biased or severely limited? Oh, that's an excellent question. So the data custodians do a ton of quality assurance and data cleaning before we put numbers out there. Um, so the CDC does that for BRFSS, so does our BRFSS uh, folks at the department. Um, certainly with death records and things like that, there's a ton of cleaning that goes into it before we put anything out. But at the end of the day, not all this data is collected um, for the purposes we use it. And there are always going to be data quality issues when you're combining you know, hundreds of clinics across the state, each of them asking at race ethnicity questions slightly differently. When you're trying to combine all of that, it's really hard to get um, uni uniformity. And Massachusetts is doing much better than a lot of states by having a lot of great community organizations like the Mass League, um, amongst others, um, hospital association, like, you know, where we get people to talk to each other to say, hey guys, let's all try and do this better so that we can use all of our data together to answer some of these questions so and then we had one last one pop up it says i'm out here on the west coast had to get up very early this morning uh but it was worth it any recommendations regarding filling data gaps or finding baseline information that is not really available as a data source so i'm so glad you joined us and <laughs> thank you for your commitment <laughs> so i guess I'd love a little bit more information what you mean by not readily available as a data source, um, baseline information. I guess that feel free to expand upon that question and we'll, we'll circle around back to it after I talk a little bit about the translation piece. But um, that really is where primary data might come in and that might also be another thing that we, we do is look to other um, disciplines. So sometimes we may not have data on um, the built environment or incarceration, but if we go to corrections or we go to our urban planners, we can find other data sources they commonly use that'll help fill that gap. And we can kind of, even if we can't get them both in the same data set, we can do things like mapping, or we can say, okay, our neighborhoods with higher rates of this also more likely to have the condition I'm working on. So those are two ways um, that we can fill in um, data beyond these more traditional data sources. But if you want to expand on your question a little bit, I can certainly circle back to it when we do the final question and answer session. All right, so now this is the last part, communicating and translating these narratives for lay audiences. So I'm gonna kind of fly through this a little bit. These are just some tips and tricks. There literally could be a whole webinar on communicating and narratives and figures and how to, um, effectively communicate with folks on any topic, data being one of those. But one way we do that is by trying to convey urgency with a hook. So focusing on what that audience cares most about and not flooding them with a billion stats, but finding one or two really obvious ones to help them understand the problem. We also try try when we're putting out publications or infographics to use short compelling statements so don't write a paragraph with like statistical language being like a confidence interval or blah 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 and like odds of this and try and really get to the point quickly um, we try and frame the numbers with themes so it's not just a list of numbers um, but rather why the numbers are important Try to use fewer, more convincing facts. So we absolutely could speak for a day about why chronic disease is important. But I think just by saying a couple important facts that almost half of Americans have one or more chronic disease, it leads to 60% of deaths, over 60% of deaths in the Commonwealth. And it accounts for over three quarters of the spending in the United States on healthcare. I mean, those are pretty convincing, right? Like, I feel pretty convinced. We don't need to keep going for 20 more minutes on that. Pair the numbers with stories for impact. 
So I would definitely caution people against only using stories, but I think when you combine a story with the numbers, you really provide some dimension and some a human face to um, your results. Use maps, figures, illustrations, and charts when possible. They're much easier to understand than just a table full of numbers. It helps you compare things also visually. And try to close with the thing that your target audience cares most about, so that when they walk away, that's what's the last thing in their mind. So here's an example. Remember that logic model I was telling you about for the municipal wellness program, where um, you know it's very linear, very chronological about how we're enacting nutrition and physical activity policies to ultimately lower chronic disease and obesity. And then I described to you um, the themes that we derive. So ordinarily, if you have a logic model like this, here's how you see results, right? In order of the logic model. Well, most of our work plan activities were completed on time. And we passed this many policies. And we recruited this many sites. And this many sites. And now this many residents have access to, to food and physical activity sites. And then we list a bunch of health outcome data that is only updated every 10 years, and we wouldn't even expect to see change in the past two years of our program anyway, right? Because we're following the order of the logic model. We're saying, okay, we passed this many policies, that's activities. We have this many sites, that's outputs. We have this many people with access, also in outputs. Um, and then we just list a bunch of outcomes that we don't even expect to change in, in until like eight to ten years from now. But because we're so obsessed with following chronology, this is how you see a lot of results, right? So instead, I wanted to give you, go back to the example of how we went back to ask our folks, our stakeholders, about themes. And these were the four themes we talked about. So instead, we decided to take all those numbers, some of which are made up, so please don't take them as real numbers of things. Um, and we focused on these themes. So first, population level change. We talk about how mass in motion, we have a short, clear statement, a hook about high level population change. And then we do highlight, and this change is done by focusing on things that affect lots of people like policies. And then these are how many policies and sites we um, recruited. But you connect it back to that theme. You connect it back to that mission statement. And then instead of just a bunch of numbers, we say, <clears throat> not only do we, did we recruit all the sites that have already agreed to participate, those are all the blue numbers that are lower down, but we're also reaching out to and engaging all these other sites that we hope to have on board in the next year. That's all the orange stuff. So we're, we are showing people, not only are we, this, this work takes a long time, right? This is the story we're weaving. You just don't pass a policy overnight. And so not only have we passed this many, but we're also working on recruiting tons of other sites as well. So, and we're doing that so that we reach the highest number of people. So instead of just listing a bunch of numbers, we show here's the population of Massachusetts. That's the orange circle. Our program covers almost a third of those, and that's the blue circle. Let's zoom in on that blue circle, right? So we serve almost 2 million, almost a third of the, of the Commonwealth. But of those folks, 84% of them live in a high need area. So that really highlights that other theme I was talking about, health equity, right? So let's take an example of how that plays out with one of our types of interventions. Through our healthy food sites, all those blue sites you saw in that bar graph, we already have covered over a third of the people living in our communities. And a lot of those folks are living in high need areas. Again, that health equity focus. So we're actually achieving these goals of those themes that we set out at the very beginning. And that's just covering the converted sites, those blue ones in the bar graph. If you include all, the, if all the sites we're, we're reaching out to and working with also um, come on board, then that number grows even more. And so we're covering even more of the population. So that's just a way that we visually took a bunch of numbers and tried to help compare and tell a story about growth and progress to really um, hook our audience. And finally, um, the sustainability theme is really important to our funders. So when we're talking to, oh, I'm sorry, this is a, hold on, I will get to sustainability momentarily. This is just an example of how we illustrated additionally our health equity focus. So, all the purple areas on this map 
are high need neighborhoods and all the shapes that you see scattered around are our sites that we've actually recruited. So that shows that they're really concentrated in these high need neighborhoods and the, the circles, the orange circles of reach show that we're really covering a lot of the folks in those neighborhoods uh, through our work. So that's another, using maps, illustrations is a much more effective way of showing people how you're living out your, your priorities and your themes. So finally, the sustainability one, which I um, almost skipped. So for our audience, um, sustainability is really important. And this wasn't data we could get from a secondary data source like we could for the maps. This we had to go out and collect. We had to do primary data collection and say, okay, how many dollars are you guys um, getting in additional grants, et cetera? And $17 million was a pretty convincing number for our funders. And that covered everything from other grants to donations to line items and municipal budgets. And so we kind of end our presentation a lot of times with this because when we're talking to people who have poured their hearts and souls into this program, they're really encouraged to know that um, it's leveraging other change in the community. So that was just a few examples of how we went from this to, uh, I hope, slightly less dry, more narrative form of, of describing success. And I cut out a ton of, of, of results and, because I just wanted to give you a flavor of how you might do that kind of translation. All right, that was a lot. Sorry guys, I probably started talking fast. You'll have to play the webinar back on slow-mo. But, um, Let's get back to some more questions. Sure, we do have some useful, uh, some questions, sorry. How useful are data from statistical models? Oh, good Lord, that's so loaded. You need to <laughs> probably go for a degree for many years to really fully answer that. But it, it's as good as, as the model, it's as good as what you put in the model, and it's as good as the context and thought that went into picking it. Just because someone uses the word model doesn't mean you trust it. You wanna say, okay, what are they trying to predict? Did they cover all the important things that we think are related to this topic? Um, and if you have stats folks on your staff or partners who can help you navigate that, if you're trying to pick a bunch of different predictive models and say, do we really trust these numbers? I would strongly advise tapping their expertise. And then the next question is, what program slash software do you use to develop figures? So for the figures that you saw today, um, I actually mostly used Excel or PowerPoint. Um, we use for mapping ArcGIS. There's a few uh, free web-based mapping programs out there, too. Um, you can use a lot of different statistical software analysis programs for generating graphs. Stata makes some nice ones. R makes some nice ones. Um, and then there are a few resources online for making infographics. Um, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember. I, this is something I can send out afterwards. There's one called Pick Something. I can't remember now off the top of my head, but. Um, is it Pick the Chart? Yeah, Pick the Chart. Yes, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't like a, a, a violation of the actual name. But anyway, <laughs> so yes, so there's a few resources online as well, but I think um, I actually keep folders of what I think are pretty effective um, infographics. So these are just some from infographics that I just really liked. Um, so that then when I have to write a report, I'm not starting like out of the clear blue sky. Um, and then I can replicate them even using Excel or PowerPoint. And the picture chart we've actually used as well. It's fairly easy to use, very user friendly. Great, great, yeah. Uh, some of my staff have used it. I personally have not, but yeah. So those are all the questions we have for now, unless people are typing in. Oh, okay. I was like worried that I did not leave enough time. I think it's good that you guys have been asking questions throughout. And our friend from the West Coast said you answered her question perfectly. So. Oh, awesome. Thank you again for joining. That's awesome. I'm really excited that we've got so much geographic coverage. So folks, feel free to type in other questions. Also, again, um, I know they're sending out the slides and maybe some additional resources if want to ask for them. Um, I'm happy to, to follow up afterwards if there are more questions. Got another question here. How can public health promote local data share, sharing among agencies, clinics, um, etc.? So there's a lot of folks doing this work already. So I think um, tapping into what coalitions already exist and what communities of practice already exist is a good call so that you're not reinventing wheels, but if you don't have a coalition like that in your area, another great thing to do is to take a look at successful models elsewhere and maybe try and build one. 
So um, the Department of Public Health, for example, has um, communities of practice around certain topics. So um, food access, uh, built environment, things like that. And so we have stakeholders from all over the state who come and talk about ways to collaborate. I know, for example, the food community of practice did some really cool work with Tufts and some other researchers and other community advocates to do some really cool mapping that was specific to Massachusetts around food deserts. So, um, yeah, getting everyone in the same room, leveraging existing networks, and then bringing them into the fold is, is a great way of doing that so that we can start sharing what we, um, what we have. Academic partners often do that already, and some clinical partners do as well, um, where they have groups of folks who meet regularly. So doing research about what's happening in your community would be great. Um, and then we have someone asking if the resources or tools can be sent out as well, along with the slides and the recordings of the presentation. And absolutely, so subscribe. Totally. If you have any other resources you would like to include, handouts, flyers, names of other software and programs that people can take advantage of, we yeah. will send that all out um, in the next couple of days for anyone who has attended the, the webinar. Absolutely, yeah, happy to do that. Um, one can also collaborate. A lot of organizations have a communications office. Um, so believe it or not, like all my slides are just made in PowerPoint except for the mapping ones. Um, so it, there's a lot possible. <laughs> so if you don't feel equipped to do that, um, you can kind of reach out if you have a communications office for help making infographics. Otherwise, there's some great um, tutorials and stuff online too. So I'm happy to send some of those out. Great. Awesome. So I know we have a couple more minutes. I don't know if, it, you know, as questions come in, feel free. I don't know, do you guys have a couple minutes or wrap up or do you want me to go over something else? Yeah, I, we can do our wrap up fairly quickly. So if there's anything else you wanted to go through, feel, feel, feel free, we need maybe 30 seconds to finish. Okay, it. sure thing. Well, I just wanted, I had prepared some cautionary tales um, just kind of as a summary of what we just went over. Um, so one cautionary tale is, don't pick data sources that are infrequently updated to show short-term sets. We do this all the time, where we're like, oh, we're going to like completely change commuting patterns or, or something from census, like uh, education levels or something like that, that we can't, we won't even get the data for 10 more years. So be careful about that. Um, don't confuse performance measures that someone funding you would be interested in to make sure you're actually spending your money wisely uh, with outcomes to show your impact of your work. So your funder probably wants to know how many patients you recruited and how many um, sites you've onboarded and, and how many activities are accomplished on time, right? Because they want to keep you accountable. But that doesn't really sell what makes your work special. And so what you want to think about is what the audience would care about. So that was just a couple of the, um, those are just a couple of the cautionary tales that I just wanted to share. And then we had a question, if someone's interested to know if you have any in-person trainings that on evaluation that they'd be able to attend. <laughs> oh, you're so kind. That's very sweet. <laughs> so no, this is actually something I don't normally do. So I, I run currently the Office of Statistics and Evaluation for the for the Bureau of Community Health and Prevention at the Department of Public Health. So my time is usually spent collecting data, analyzing it, figuring out what the worst health problems are facing the Commonwealth, writing reports, uh, making sure we're spending our money in the right way. So this is something I do. I, I love this. I love the community work you guys do. I feel very passionately that um, you know we, we should equip you guys. So I do this just you know as a, as a courtesy. Um, maybe someday when I retire, I'll do more appearances. I do want to sort of do a quick plug mm -hmm. for an in-person training that we have happening in October, October 26th specifically. Um, there is a quality improvement uh, in-person training that we have happening in the Worcester area. Um, and that goes over something that actually you mentioned earlier in your webinar scenarios that they go over the PDSA cycle, the Plan awesome. Study Act cycle. Um, and following that in-person training is a training on sustainability. 
Um, and it is geared towards coalitions, but anybody can come. And again, all of our trainings are free, um, which gives us a great segue towards the end of our presentation. So um, please feel free to visit our website. You can register for all of our trainings that are free, um, along with updating your coalition's information if you do fall into that category. We want to thank Sonori so much for leading our online training today. We're very excited to kick off our uh, training calendar this year and more to come from us please feel free to connect with us on twitter social media and we will send the information along from this presentation thank you so much for joining us today